uh, continuing the Bible study that we are doing on biblical covenants. And specifically, I'm going to be preaching about the subject of the circumcision of the Old Covenant and the circumcision of the New Covenant. The circumcision of the Old and New Covenant. So these are going to be a comparison between the physical circumcision and the spiritual circumcision in the Bible, which I've in my life, I've never heard a full sermon on that. And it's a, it's a very, uh, uh, and it's extremely interesting interesting subject, at least to myself, so I hope you'll find it interesting as well. Here in Romans chapter number 4, we see in detail the salvation of Abraham being discussed. And of course, it emphasizes the fact that salvation is by grace through faith alone. It is not of works. It is not of our own merit. It is not of anything that we do or of what we earn. It is based solely on the fact that we trusted Jesus Christ and what He did to save us. And at that moment, we are saved. Now, after that, the Bible mentions something very interesting about Abraham's salvation. And I want you to look with me at verse number 9. It says this, Cometh this blessedness, and that's the, the blessing of the gospel or the blessing of salvation. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? So there when it says the circumcision only, it's talking about the Jews. It's talking about those that were the, the, the physical descendants or at least of the nation of Abraham. When it says the circumcision, it's talking about the Jews. Then it says, or upon the uncircumcision also. Talking about the Gentiles, anybody who's not of Israel, anybody who's not of the, the nation of the Jews. For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When, it was, when he was in circumcision... Or in uncircumcision. And then he says this. Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. So Abraham received righteousness when he was still in his uncircumcision state. His uncircumcised state. He had not yet been circumcised. He had not performed that uh, procedure or that surgery upon himself where he was a circumcised man at that point. So he, they're actually demonstrating uh, based upon the father of circumcision, based upon the father really if you, of the nation of Israel if you want to go back that far, that he himself was saved and was made righteous before he was even circumcised. So it even shows the ridiculousness and the foolishness of people that will try to teach that you must be circumcised in order to be saved. When the father of of many nations, the father Abraham, who was basically the father of the nation of Israel, the patriarch, he himself was saved when he wasn't even circumcised. He had received righteousness before he was ever even circumcised. And the way to absolutely prove that and to show how silly it is, is based on verse number 11. Notice what it says. And he received the sign of circumcision. So notice that circumcision is just a sign. It's a token. It's, it symbolizes something. The sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. So notice, what was the purpose of Abraham's physical circumcision? This is very important so we can understand fundamentally and on a rudimentary level of all the basic things you know, within the Bible. We need to have a, a simple, easy answer for all of the different teachings and doctrines in the Bible. What was the purpose of circumcision when it was given to Abraham? It was given as a seal of the righteousness which he had yet being uncircumcised. So it was a seal of his righteousness. It was a seal. It was meant to symbolize the fact that he would forever be made righteous or have this imputed righteousness. It would never leave him. Christ would never leave him or forsake him in that sense. He would be eternally secure, eternally saved. That's what it was a symbol of. I want you to go to Genesis chapter number 15 where we actually see where... Uh, Abraham puts his faith in the Lord and is saved. Genesis chapter number 15. Look with me at verse number 6. I believe it's verse number 6. Genesis chapter number 15, verse number 6. It says, And he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. So God saw the faith in Abraham's heart, and he counted that, or he considered that, righteousness. So for his faith, he gave him righteousness. Righteousness. Now I want you to look over at Genesis chapter number 17. Genesis chapter number 17 is actually where 
The sign of circumcision is given. The sign of circumcision is given, the physical sign, or the physical circumcision is given in Genesis chapter number 17. So of course, he was made righteous in Genesis 15, and now in Genesis 17, we're going to see the sign of circumcision and when it is actually given. I want you to look with me at verse number 4. As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee, and thy seed after thee, and their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And then he says this, verse number 9, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant therefore, thou and thy seed after thee in their generation. So this is a separate covenant. This is actually, and it, it's, a, it's a distinct covenant, but it is attached. It's, like, it's, it's basically like it's part B of the other covenant. It's, it's attached to the other covenant because it's meant to be a seal of the, or of the gospel, which is, you know, ultimately ends up being the new covenant. So, as we read in Romans 4. But look here what it says in verse 10. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. So this is not the covenant that was given to him that he would be a father of many nations and that he would have the land of Israel or the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession. It's a different covenant. It's the covenant of circumcision. This is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. And ye shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. So remember in Romans chapter number 4 it actually uses the word seal. It used the word seal. It was the seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. So when Abraham performed this surgery, it was, it was an irreversible surgery. It was something that you couldn't go back on. Once you're circumcised, you are circumcised for life. And that's why it says it's an everlasting covenant that will be in your flesh. That's why it's a seal. It's never changing. It's something that's going to be there as a reminder and a sign forever. But what's the purpose of it? It's meant to be a sign, as I said, of the original covenant or of what's going to be the new covenant that was given to Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, which we know to be the gospel. It's meant to represent the new covenant and the eternal security that we have in the new covenant. I want you to turn now, go to Jeremiah chapter number 32, verse number 40. So the three points about the spiritual circumcision and the physical circumcision that I'm going to give you this evening. Three different points. <clears throat> we need to keep in mind, as we've looked at already, with the two covenants. There's the old covenant and there's the new covenant. Of course, the old covenant represents works. It represents flesh. It represents unrighteousness. You know what else it represents is physical circumcision. The, the new covenant represents grace. It represents the Spirit of God. It represents Christ and it represents righteousness. These are the different characteristics that these different covenants are detailed by or explained by. So you're there in Jeremiah chapter number 32 verse number 40. Jeremiah chapter number 32 verse number 40. Let me get there myself. Jeremiah chapter number 32 verse number 40. Just reiterating what we read there in Genesis 17. This is brought up again. He says, And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. But I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. So, notice there that he says that this is going to be an everlasting covenant covenant. It's going to be an everlasting covenant. Now, what was the purpose of circumcision? The circumcision was supposed to be a seal of the righteousness which he had received. A seal of God's promise, if you will. A seal of the first covenant, which is, you know, not the first covenant in order, but first covenant within those two covenants, right? 
the, uh, of the new covenant that he had received, which was the gospel. Now notice again, and this was one of the characteristics of the new covenant. One of the differences between the old covenant and the new covenant was that the old covenant was temporary. The old covenant didn't last forever. The old covenant could have been broken, right? The new covenant was eternal. The new covenant was everlasting. It was never ending. And that's what circumcision is supposed to represent. The physical in the Bible always represents the spiritual. It's always a figure of the spiritual. If you remember from Hebrews chapter number 9 this past week, uh, Wednesday night, when we, when we studied the earthly or the worldly sanctuary, it pictured the true. So the physical was a picture of the spiritual of that which was, which was in heaven. You know, all of the different aspects of it. The sprinkling of the blood represent the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, the water and blood that came out of, his, uh, out of his side. Also him sprinkling the blood in heaven. And just the, 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 you know, the physical cherubims that we saw in the worldly sanctuary, they represented the spiritual angels, the spiritual cherubims in heaven. So the physical circumcision of the Old Testament has a picture there. And it pictures... The New Testament, the physical circumcision is going to picture the spiritual circumcision. I want you to go back to Romans chapter number 4. Romans chapter number 4, verse number 9. Romans chapter number 4, actually we'll just go ahead and read verse number 11, which I had quoted a few different times. I want, I want to go ahead and read that and I want you also to, uh, I want you to get your hand... I want you also to get your hand in, in uh, Exodus chapter number 25. Exodus chapter number 25. <clears throat> now this is very important to understand. Well, what's the purpose? And I mentioned this one other time, so I want to reiterate this right now so I can tie a few things together. What's the purpose of, what was the purpose of the physical circumcision? Well, the Bible tells you in Romans 4.11 that it was meant to be a seal. Right? He says, and he received the sign of circumcision. A seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised. That he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised. That righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So here in... Uh, in and we read it there in Genesis chapter number 17. We read about when, when uh, Abraham himself actually performs... Abraham actually performs after the, you know, the covenant's given. He, of course, goes through with it and he performs the procedure of circumcision. And I'm sure I don't need to go into detail, but of course, you know, the Bible, I won't go any further than what the Bible explains, but it's, it's cutting off of the foreskin. And it tells you in verse number 14, "...and the circumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that sh soul shall be cut off from his people." And it says, "...he hath broken..." My covenant. Now, right after this, of course, it records Abraham circumcising himself and then circumcising all of the other men, ch children, all of the other, you know, servants, everyone in his house, and also Ishmael right after this. So, what does he do? He, he, of course, removes the foreskin, right? That's what he does. So, he cuts off the foreskin. I want you to look with me. Did, did you already go and turn to Exodus chapter 25? Okay, let me get to Exodus chapter number 25, verse number 4. And what this pictures is the putting off of the flesh. This pictures the putting off of the old man. It's getting rid of the foreskin. And what is that? Once you cut that skin off, what is it? It's dead. That skin is dead, and what do you do with it? You, of course, just toss it away. It's getting rid of the old man who is now dead. I want you to look with me at Exodus chapter number 25. Exodus chapter number 25. This is not the right passage. Exodus chapter number 20. Yeah, that's not the right passage. We'll just skip it. Go to Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. Go to the New Testament. Colossians chapter number 2. <clears throat> Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Colossians chapter number 2. And you'll actually see this explained here in Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 11. The Bible says, "...in whom also ye are circumcised..." with the circumcision made without hands. So notice that the parallel being drawn right now is the moment of salvation when we receive the Holy Spirit. And it likens that unto being circumcised, right? But it says that this is a circumcision that's made without hands. So it's just like or similar unto the physical circumcision. But this one is made without hands. It's a spiritual circumcision. It says, "...in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh 
by the circumcision of Christ. And then it goes on to explain this a little further. Buried with Him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised Him from the dead. Verse 13, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath He quickened together with Him, having forgiven you all trespasses. So notice this is actually a connection that the Bible itself makes for you. That that uh, uh, operation or procedure of circumcision that took place in the Old Testament, the physical circumcision and the removal of the foreskin was actually a picture of the New Testament spiritual circumcision of when we would receive the Holy Spirit and God you know, quickens our spirit. And actually what takes place in that very moment, our sins are forgiven. You know, our soul previously was dead. We had no life within us. We were dead in our trespasses and in our sins. We received the Spirit of God. And at that very moment, the operation of the death, burial, and resurrection takes place in us. We receive that, uh, you know, the Holy Spirit and we receive that life. And all of our sins are then paid for. And we've put off the flesh. That's the, the, the picture of the putting off of the foreskin going on in the uh, uh, process of circumcision. So that is the picture. That's the point number one. That's how the physical circumcision actually pictured spiritual circumcision. So this is within the biblical covenants. I want you to go now to Romans chapter number 2 verse number 28. Romans chapter number 2 verse number 28. <clears throat> so what's the purpose? The purpose is that we are then made a new creature. We are then made a new creature at that very moment. <clears throat> the old man is done away with. The old man is dead. The old man is gone. Right? That would be, as I said, the foreskin. It's dead. It's gone. It's done away with. It's thrown away. But there needs to be a new man that replaces it. And that is the Spirit of God that we receive in the spiritual circumcision. That's the Spirit of the Lord. Look at Romans chapter number 2, verse number 28. It says, For he is not a Jew which is one outwardly, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. Saying that it's not the true circumcision that makes you a real Jew or a true Jew in God's eyes. Verse 29, But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the Spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. I want you to go to Jeremiah chapter number 4. Jeremiah chapter number 4. So the foreskin symbolizes the flesh, the works of the flesh. It symbolizes sin. And at the moment of salvation, there's a putting away of that. And it's dead, and it's buried, and it's gone. And our spirit is then quickened, and it's made new and made alive. Jeremiah chapter number 4, the Old Testament actually mentions the spiritual circumcision numerous times. Jeremiah chapter number 4, look with me at verse number 4. Jeremiah chapter number 4, verse number 4. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord and take away the foreskins of your heart. Ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. And then he goes on, Declare ye in Judah and publish in Jerusalem and say, Blow ye the trumpet in the land. Cry, gather together and say, Assemble yourselves and let us go into the defensed cities. Turn to Ezekiel chapter number 11 and we'll see that again. So the Holy Spirit actually pictures the new man. That's the new man. Ezekiel chapter number 11, verse number 19. <clears throat> and we're given a new heart with the, uh, with the Holy Spirit. We're made a new creature. Look at Ezekiel chapter number 11. Look at verse number 19. The Bible says, And I will give them one heart, saying that we're all, we all have the same heart. Everyone in here that is saved and born again, we all have that same spirit, that one heart, that one same spirit, and that is, of course, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit. Look at verse number, uh, keep reading there, verse number 19, and I will put a new spirit within you, and I will take the stony heart of their flesh and will give them an heart of flesh. So notice that he's going to take away the stony heart of their flesh, he says, and will give them an heart of flesh, saying new, a new heart, a new heart of flesh. Go to Ezekiel chapter number 44, verse number 7. Ezekiel chapter number 44, verse number 7. So notice how he keeps likening these things to one another. Ezekiel chapter number 44, verse number 7. So this is not only a New Testament doctrine. This is taught multiple times. And, and uh, 
this is the purpose of it is that the old man is buried because the old man has to be done away with. The old man's a sinner. The old man's not good. He has to be done away with. He, you can't just reform him. He, ha he has you know, a punishment that has to be paid. That's what that pictures. That's what that pictures, the procedure of, of the, of the uh, foreskin and of the circumcision. It pictures that it has to be done away with. It ha there has to be something brand new. There has to be a new creature. So it's totally done away with. It's buried. It's gone. And there's a new creature. You have the Holy Spirit that lives inside you. Look at Ezekiel chapter number 44, verse number 7. In that ye have brought into my sanctuary strangers. Now watch this. Uncircumcised in heart and uncircumcised in flesh. To be in my sanctuary, to pollute it. Even my house. When ye offer my bread, the fat and the... Uh, and uh, in the blood, and they have broken my covenant because of all your abominations. And ye have not kept the charge of mine holy things, but ye have set keepers of my charge in my sanctuary for yourselves. So notice in the Old Testament, even then, he makes a distinction between those that are, that are uncircumcised in heart, and then he says, and uncircumcised in the flesh. So notice that these people were not only, not only following the covenants of being a Jew physically, and following the commandments of the physical circumcision and that procedure that was handed to Abraham and was meant to be handed down to all of the Israelites, but they were not circumcised of the heart either. And what was that referring to in Romans chapter number 2, verse number 28 and 29? It was talking about them being saved. It was talking about them putting their faith in Christ. That was the circumcision of the spirit or the circumcision of the heart. While we're in Ezekiel, go to Ezekiel chapter number 36. Ezekiel chapter number 36. Now this ties in we're going to see very clearly with the new covenant because the physical circumcision represents the old covenant over and over again the physical circumcision represents the old covenant it's that of the flesh it's that of the works notice that it's a physical work that you have to do it's a physical act that has to take place that you must do yourselves and oftentimes when people were trying to convince, when the Jews specifically, when they were trying to convince others and Gentiles that you must trust in the works of the law, what specifically did they keep saying? What did they say in the book of Acts? What did they say in the book of Galatians? You must be circumcised. That's why they're characterized by the Old Covenant and by specifically being that of circumcision. This was something big that they harped on over and over and over again because the physical circumcision represents the Old Covenant. But you know what the spiritual circumcision represents? That of the heart or that of the spirit. It represents the New Covenant. The spiritual circumcision represents the New Covenant. Look with me as I said at Ezekiel chapter number 36. And this is uh, my third point which is the promise. So first there, point number one, we saw that there was the picture. We saw how the physical represented the spiritual. The physical circumcision that was first given, just like the Old Covenant and all the things that pertain to it, represented the New Covenant. Well, the picture of the, or the physical circumcision was a picture of the spiritual circumcision. Then the next point that we saw was what was the purpose? What was the purpose? Now point number three is the promise. The promise. So this is the promise of the New Covenant. Look at Ezekiel chapter number 36. Look at verse number 25. Ezekiel chapter 36 verse number 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. From all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. Now watch this, verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you an heart of flesh. And I will, I'm sorry, yeah, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And ye shall keep my judgments and do them. I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 with that in mind. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. And we've turned to this a few different times recently in the study of the book of Hebrews. And this is very applicable to the to the Bible study in Hebrews right now where we're speaking about the Old Covenant and the New Covenant uh, quite a bit. So it's 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. 
And this right here is actually the chapter that discusses the Old Covenant, the New Covenant. Look at verse number 1. It says, Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle, watch this, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us. Now watch this closely. Written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Now watch this closely as well. Not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. Now over and over again, I don't know if you noticed that this, but God kept saying in the book of Ezekiel in a couple of those passages where we read, He made this statement. He said, And I will take away the stony heart of your flesh. So he says, I'm going to take away the stony heart of your flesh. And then he says this, and I will give you an heart of flesh. So you're probably wondering, what does he mean by the stony heart of your flesh? Well, if you look there again, 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse number 3, notice carefully how he words this. <clears throat> he says this, For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone. That's the stony heart of flesh. That's the old covenant. That's the physical circumcision. Then he says this, but in fleshly tables of the heart. That is the promise that he gave where he says, and I will give you an heart of flesh. That is the new covenant. And what is the comparison that's being made here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse number 3? He's talking about how it's not of the law. It's not of the letter. It's of the new covenant. Keep reading there, verse number 4. And such trust have we through Christ to Godward. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter. Say, not of the old covenant. Not of that which is of the stony tables, right? Uh, and then it goes on and says, or the stone tables. And then it goes on and says, but of the Spirit, for the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death written and engraven in stones was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? So in the Old Testament, when you see those references over and over again about a stony heart and talking about taking away your stony heart and giving you a heart of flesh, that is a specific reference to the Old Covenant being removed and the New Covenant being put into place. The proof of that is a clear reference to 2 Corinthians chapter number 3, verse number 3. Now, if you're still in Ezekiel, look at Ezekiel chapter 37, verse number 14 with that in mind. Ezekiel chapter number 37, verse number 14, it says, And shall put my spirit in you, and ye shall live. And I shall place you in your own land. Then shall you know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, saith the Lord. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 9. Jeremiah chapter number 9. <clears throat> the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter number 9. Jeremiah chapter number 9, look at verse number 25. <clears throat> It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord. Remember, this is the promise. Prophesying of replacing the old covenant with the new covenant. Replacing the stony heart of flesh with a new heart or a new spirit. Right? Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will punish all them which are circumcised with the uncircumcised. Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab and all that are in the utmost corners that dwell in the wilderness. For all these nations, he says, are uncircumcised. And all the house of Israel are uncircumcised in heart. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 31. Jeremiah chapter number 31. <clears throat> so God's prophesying about when He's going to establish a new covenant wherein He was going to give us the Holy Spirit and by so doing He was going to circumcise our heart of flesh and give us the, the or our stony hearts 
and give us a heart of flesh and give us His Spirit. So look there in Jeremiah 31, look at verse number 31. We read this recently a few different times. This, everything that we're reading now, think of this in mind. It says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to, co to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break. Although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and will remember their sin no more. Go to Jeremiah chapter number 6. So notice how all these passages tie together with that new covenant. And we can see clearly even more so that it's speaking about the receiving or the reception of the Holy Spirit and the new covenant replacing the old covenant. We're going to see here some mentions of the uncircumcised heart further in the Old Testament. Look at Jeremiah chapter number 6, verse number 10. Jeremiah chapter number 6, verse number 10, it says, To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Behold, their ear <coughs> is uncircumcised and they cannot hear. Behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. I want you to go to the New Testament now, please. Galatians chapter number 3. Galatians chapter number 3. So we saw this new covenant that, was, that is uh, prophesied of. We see repeatedly that when he talks about, I'm going to make this new covenant, a big part of that is that he's going to take away the, the, stony, the stony hearts of flesh that we have and he's going to give us a heart of flesh. He's going to give us the Holy Spirit. And it's going to cause us or allow us to be able to walk in his commandments and to walk in his ways and we're all going to know him. And that's the fulfillment of the new covenant. That is the fulfillment of the New Testament that took place you know, with Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us. Look here at Galatians chapter number 3. Whoops, Galatians chapter number 3, verse number 14. Galatians chapter number 3, verse number 14. It says this, That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. And then it says this, That we might receive, notice this carefully, the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now that's easy to read over, but oftentimes you don't think about that there was the promise that was given in the Old Testament scriptures. There was the promise given that God was going to give us His Spirit and that He was going to give us a new heart. I want you to turn and we're going to end here. Ephesians chapter number 1 verse number 13. Ephesians chapter number 1 verse number 13. The promise of the Spirit the promise of the Spirit is the new covenant. And when we enter into the new covenant is at the moment we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what happens? We're circumcised of the heart. We receive the Holy Spirit. We receive the new covenant. We receive you know, the new heart that God gives unto us. And what took place with Abraham when he put his faith in God? Afterwards, he was circumcised as well physical circumcision. He said it was going to be an everlasting token in his flesh. It was going to be an everlasting token. It was irreversible. It was meant to be a sign of the covenant that he had already made with God and he had put his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that he was going to heaven. He has put his faith in God. So I wanted you to look with me. It's just the very next book, Ephesians chapter number 1. <clears throat> Notice it's the promise of the Spirit that was made in the Old Testament. And I want you to notice what the promise of the Spirit is. Furthermore, it says this, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, now pay close attention, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now, what was the seal for Abraham when he put his faith in God? Circumcision. What type of circumcision? The physical circumcision. The Bible tells you in Romans chapter number 4 that he had the seal. He received the seal of, the, of uh, uh, the righteousness. A seal of his righteousness which he had yet being uncircumcised. So that was a seal of his righteousness. That was a seal of his salvation. That was a seal of the promise that God had made with him. The physical circumcision was. But I want you to notice here, what is our seal now? It says... Ye were sealed. After we believed, 
It says, ye were sealed, and then it says, with that Holy Spirit of promise. So notice that what is our seal today? Our seal today under the new covenant, it's not the physical. The physical was just a picture of this. Our seal today is the Holy Spirit. When we are circumcised of the heart, when we are circumcised inwardly, circumcised spiritually, you know, as opposed to the physical circumcision, as I said, that was just a picture. And what, what is it? It's the Holy Spirit, it's easy to read over this, of promise. Every time you look up, the Spirit of Promise, the Holy Spirit of Promise in the Old Testament, where we looked, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, every time it's God promising and giving a, a, a covenant, a promise to the nation of Israel that He is one day going to make a new covenant with them and a major part of that covenant, these two things are part and parcel, is that He is going to give them a new heart and He is going to give them a new spirit. And that specifically is a seal of the new covenant. That specifically is a seal of our righteousness that we have under the new covenant. So what was the purpose of the physical circumcision? It was meant to be a seal of Abraham's righteousness. And what did it do? Because everything always points towards something. And you know what happens throughout the Bible is that once that thing is fulfilled, the, the picture or the figure is done away with. Are we to be physically circumcised today? No. Do you know why? Because the physical circumcision was just a picture of the true. And what is the true? The spiritual circumcision. So that old covenant, it had attached with it the physical circumcision. And it was just a picture of the true circumcision. And the old covenant itself had so many things that just pictured the new covenant. And when the new covenant came into place and the old covenant was done away with, once that took place, then that's when we were given the Spirit. The Spirit of Promise. And what is the Spirit of Promise? It's the true seal. The physical circumcision was not the true seal. The spiritual circumcision is the true seal. And we are sealed unto, the Bible says, the day of redemption. Amen. Let's read that. Ephesians 4.30 and then we'll end. Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 30. You'll see it mentioned as being a seal again. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So these are important, basic, but yet important points to understand about circumcision. The whole point of physical circumcision was to be a picture. It was meant to be a, a, a seal to Abraham and a sign and a token. It was a sign and a token, and that means that it symbolized something. And that seal was supposed to represent, that physical seal was supposed to represent the spiritual seal. Once we receive the Holy Spirit, we're saved forever. We can never lose our salvation. And that was the whole entire purpose of the physical circumcision. This is a very basic truth, but it's very simple. It's just like the physical lamb of the Old Testament represented who? Jesus Christ. The spiritual sacrifice, right? Uh, we, you could go on and on and on with that. But it's, it's very important to understand what is attached with the Old Covenant, what is attached with the New Covenant. And we need to get back to basics. Sometimes we, 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 uh, we, we know what circumcision is to a degree, but we don't know the basic answers of what's the purpose of it. Why did God implement it in the first place? And once the spiritual came into effect, once the, the new covenant came into effect, which was part and parcel with the Holy Spirit being given, the Holy Spirit of promise, that's when the, the uh, old covenant was done away with and the circumcision which represented it. It was out of the way at that time. So thank God for the new covenant and the Holy Spirit of promise. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, how it is just a perfect book. It's so intricate, but yet so uh, uh, consistent, dear Lord God. We thank you, dear Lord, that we can study it, we can learn from it, we can grow from it. We ask you to help us to have zeal and to love your word more and more each day. Help us to have an understanding of it. Help us to teach it to others, dear God. We ask you to bless our church, be with all the prayer requests that we mentioned, uh, dear Lord, and uh, just be with all of us here, dear God, and in every area of our life. Help us just to better ourselves as Christians and to be more, uh, uh, each day, to be more pleasing unto you. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.